All right, Kyle Bradshaw here. We're out here at the Paris Raceway today to take a look at a brand new 6D offering. So this is a 6D media launch for a new youth helmet that they're just bringing out. So we're pretty excited for this opportunity to come out here and take a look at this new helmet. Uh, so today we're here to introduce the new ATR2 youth helmet. Um, it's the second generation of the youth helmet and I uh, like the ATR2 adult is superseding uh, the ATR1 original. Uh, 60 motocross helmet. So and that gets us uh, rolling here. A couple other things I wanted to touch on real quick as I got started is just a little bit of the education process that we've been through with the industry and the media and the consumer over uh, this last six years. When Robert and I got started, I was aware of some issues that were going on with brain injury and what helmets weren't doing to protect the athlete in that accident event. And I uh, got together with Robert to figure out if we could build a better mousetrap, so to speak. And, and that was the genesis of two years of work in developing the ATR1 and the original yes, technology that's infused in every 60 helmet. By now, we've uh, multiple patents over the past six years. We've got patents pending that are further extensions of the original ODS technology, and we've actually got additional patent pending in the head space. So, um, from the beginning, we've had a number of high-profile young youth athletes that have endorsed the helmet pretty much from the beginning. Liam Everts. Ryder DeFrancesco, uh, Hayden Deegan, we've got Logan Best, thank you, and Canyon Richards, and the, the net net of that is we've got a lot of young athletes that have been in the 60 helmet from day one, and the parents have paid attention to the technology, and, and obviously their most highest interest is their son or daughter's safety on the racetrack, and something that we've worked hard to bring to helmets and to also uh, educate consumers out there. By now we've sold helmets all over the world, which is a pretty exciting thing. You know, it's pretty interesting when we go to some of the large amateur races around the country, uh, like us in some of the classes, uh, particularly in the smaller 50 and 65 cc classes, we might have, you know, 50, 55 percent of the rider gate. So a little bit about some brain injury statistics that are uh, interesting and, you know, not really well known out there, but I think most important thing up here is uh, that first bullet point of, of over 4 million injuries reported over that 11 year period. You know, it's a significant number of injury and 11 and a half percent of those uh, were head and neck injuries. And as you delve down into that number, those four sports listed uh, were the highest in total incidents. So skateboarding, uh, snowboarding, skiing, and motocross was number four with 78,000 serious head or neck injuries. Breaking that down further, two and a half percent of that 78,000 was considered severe brain injuries. And so that's breaking down to uh, over 2,000 brain injuries. And when you look at the audience and the size of our sport out there, that's a pretty significant number. And obviously something you don't want to see happening to your son or daughter. This next little bullet point of information was a study from a single race, but it had some really interesting statistics. And uh, up to 50% of the riders had experienced a concussion-related uh, symptom from a motocross uh, accident in that same year and 33% of those people uh, indicated that they had multiple uh, incidents over the year. In general, you know, more than half of those guys continued riding that day. That's really not a good idea. We know that second impact syndrome is a serious condition and uh, result in a death if it's a severe enough situation. Certainly traumatic brain injury is something that's difficult to heal, heal from and we know that brain does not heal very well. 24% of those continue riding the season without a problem, but I think it was another 23% of those uh, were back in the emergency room within a couple of weeks with ongoing concussion-related symptoms, head injury, or excuse me, headache and, and such, uh, vision, difficulty sleeping, some of the common uh, side effects of concussion. The, another component there, over a million Americans sustain a concussion each year, and 30% of that is coming from uh, sports-related incidents. So brain injury is obviously a serious, life-changing event, and it is something that we're all trying to prevent in the 
the home of space for any particular sports category for that matter. You guys know last year we announced that we won the Head Health Challenge, which was a over one year long, deep, in-depth study of our technology in a multi-impact environment for potential use in a football helmet or a multi-impact type helmet. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in detail later. We've been through that before. Chronologically, we've added seven products to the company in six years. Um, one of those is I kind of not counting because it was a pretty quick reintroduction of the, of the first generation of our mountain bike helmet. But we made a significant improvement in the technology in the bicycle helmet in 2017 uh, 17 based on information that we learned and deemed valuable inside the Head Health Challenge. And so every helmet beyond the 2017 uh, year marker there, the ATR2 and now the youth helmet, has a further generation of the technology infused into it. 2019 for 6D is going to be a pretty exciting year. We is the first introduction of a new product for this year and we'll have three more over the course of the coming year. So uh, we used this slide back in February of last year when we introduced the ATR2 to the world, but you know our mission statement is still the same. The goal of 6D is to provide the public and the consumer out there with a superior safety helmet from both a technological perspective and a design and safety perspective. So we're rolling into uh, the new ATR2 Advanced ODS. This is unquestionably the most sophisticated and advanced youth specific motocross helmet uh, designed and, and available to the consumer anywhere today. Well, the ATR2, as Bob said, is a specific design helmet. It's uh, specifically oriented to uh, smaller headmasters for youth applications, and that's a, a key point that you keep in mind when we come to helmets, because a lot of youth end up inside on uh, small adult helmets, and they're bigger and uh, homologated to heavier headmasters. So that helmet doesn't perform as well as it should or could for the, the smaller headmasters of the kit. The ATR2 as well as the original ATR1 are fundamentally two helmets, a helmet within a helmet. Uh, starting with our inner liner assembly and uh, having it coupled to our outer liner assembly and, and breaking up the two uh, surfaces so we can uh, introduce the ability for uh, omnidirectional suspension inside the helmet that allows us to mitigate uh, angular accelerations and also to mitigate low threshold energy and the impact event. The ATR uh, to the youth uh, is a modular design because we designed it from the beginning to be rebuildable. The ATR1, we didn't have that in mind when we designed it, but as we felt the pain of our customers damaging their helmets early on, knowing it's an expensive helmet, we, we looked at it and found out that we could rebuild the helmets, and we started a rebuild program. And to a big success for our customers, we decided that we would incorporate that rebuild feature in the design of the ATR2. As a replaceable inner liner, the outside EPP is multi-impact, progressive uh, a damping uh, design of the system has been enhanced from the ATR1. We increase our rotational uh, capabilities with low friction discs, and we continue to use our isolation dampers as originally put in the ATR1. We've increased our ability to shear inside the helmet to improve our angular acceleration. Just to give you a, a, another overview of the ATR2 in, in the youth model, it's like its parent or its, its uh, siblings of the ATR2 adult helmet. Uh, starting from the outside, if we we look at it, we start with a, an optimized shell design. The shell is important, and over history, you know, shells have been considered uh, over a wide range of considerations from how stiff they should be, how hard they should be, what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, what we know today is that we need to have the shell as soft as we can so it can uh, flex and, and articulate and absorb energy, but we still have to manage those impact events, especially in motocross, the first lap, the first turn, where you have foot pegs and, and uh, actual nuts and bolts and things that can come by fork legs that can pierce and penetrate the helmet. Unfortunately, in North America, we have the DRT standard, and that requires a penetration test, where the ECE in Europe doesn't. Um, so we, we tune it and design our shell to meet the DOT penetration and impacts, the ECE uh, penetration, or not penetration, but impact, high velocity impacts. And then we have our own uh, 6D um, testing protocols, where we increase certain structural areas of the helmet shell uh, to meet a higher impact loading because we've seen helmets being ripped apart from axles and foot pegs that we want to still protect the areas that aren't part of the testing protocol when we add those in. Moving to the right, our multi-impact, if we move in one layer, we're looking at uh, the EPP, the outer liner assembly, and that outer liner assembly is now a multi-impact material. It's coupled to the outer shell, and that material can 
sustain numerous impacts and still absorb energy, unlike the standard EPS material that's been put in the traditional home. Design incorporates things we call variable height damping towers. Those damping towers you either have red friction discs on them or they're, they're stepped back away from the surface. Those damping towers absorb our linear energy more efficiently. We have included in the design the modular uh, carrier system, which uh, helps connect the two pieces, the inner liner and the outer liner. And then the inner replaceable EPS liner itself so is a typical Benicoy styrene liner assembly. And that is our first line of defense in this helmet. It's our crushable member that we want to crush and have energy absorb. And during an impact event, that item, if it is damaged, can be replaced in the helmet. And that's the rebuild of the part. Um, we still incorporate our last American isolation damage uh, from the original ATR-1. Um, what's different and why is it that important um, in this structure? Well, uh, low friction discs, again, in more components of, of the helmet provide us the ability to uncouple the outside surface and the inner part of the helmet more efficiently and allow more displacement for uh, the angular energy. We added in a structural brow rib up in the front of the helmet where the eye port opening is. We found over the, the years that we, as we examined helmets that were coming in from customers that there is a weakness in the shell in the front there because you have a big opening in the front of the helmet. So the edge of the, the shell isn't as strong as, as the shell is a few inches away from that edge. And there would be big impacts um, that can happen there from your handlebars and your, your bar perches and stuff. So we tried to increase, or we did increase, the structural strength of the shell up in there by putting that brow rib in. We incorporated EPP again, a softer material, uh, multi-impact in the chin bar area. Instead of having really high density EPS panels in there, we went to a softer material that wraps around to the front of the helmet for our sternum, sternum pad. So we protect our, our sternum from the impacts of the helmet by having a, a softer material, which has been in our, our ATR1 and our ATR2 parent. And we added in a cervical protection zone in the back of the helmet. Again, in studying the helmets coming in, we saw damage in the back of the helmets. A handful of them that made us concerned that we could do a better job in the back of the helmet by providing some relief areas so the edge of the shell isn't compressing against the cervical area of your spine back in there. And we provided a padding system all the way up through there to add an additional safety. We have our, our primary areas of, of energy absorption that we're looking at are linear accelerations and angular. So we're going to go over and look at these a little bit. The difference in our, our technology is that these are two plots that we've compared against other helmets in the industry with technology in our, our technology. This is at three meters per second, which is a low velocity impact uh, compared to the standard uh, testing protocols. But it's a very typical impact you might get if you fall over in the corner. And we can see in that that the, the ATR2 helmet in the green has a very smooth profile. You look at the slope of the line, the change is that, the lower that slope is, the better it is for energy absorption versus the abrupt acceleration or to add in the magnitude of the PGs. We also look at the distance in time. These are about four or five milliseconds to peak cheese while we're out here, almost double or two thirds of the time. We're adding more time to the energy absorption. It reduces the amount of energy that the brain has to deal with. And in addition to that is that we're getting close to 60 Gs. And uh, uh, medical journals, they've established that somewhere around 60 Gs is what the adult male starts to sustain in concussion. And so at a small impact velocity of three meters per second, we can see that typical helmets that are out there with various technologies are already pushing up against that at three meters per second while our ATR2 is down to 30 uh, Gs. To clarify, those are other competitive use helmets. In linear acceleration, when we look at different velocities, we have now 4 meters per second and 7.75. This is the, the ECE uh, test velocity, which is higher than the, the DOT. Um, just to give you a range of, of the, from high to low, we have, again, the, the ATR2 in the 4 meters per second, still under 40 Gs, while uh, other competitive technologies are now all at or above 60 Gs in our testing. At 7.5, the same thing. We see the desired slope line being lower, and we see the magnitude being less. Angular acceleration. We've known it now for, for a long time that angular acceleration is the number one uh, injury metric in the brain from impact events. And so we need to incorporate angular mitigation technologies within the helmet. And 60 introduced this concept with our ATR1 in an effective manner into a production helmet. The angular acceleration at three meters per second in our ATR2 use helmet again, is we can see that we're in the much lower range that the other helmets, our slope lines, our transition, our times to peak are bigger and longer. When we look at it from four meters per second and seven, about five meters per second. We see the same benefits of the ATR2 in green, 
um, where we again extend out our, our peak time. We could call this peak, but things get a little erratic sometimes towards the end of the, the impact event. But even at, at these points in here, we're extending those times. We're keeping our, our maximum accelerations lower, or we're changing a lot of the, the curve and body time during that deceleration. So the angular part of the helmet performs extremely well in the new ATR2 platform. Out of all of that, the, the summation is that when we take our velocities and our, our peak G loadings or accelerations, and we look at them and compare them against different technologies at three meters per second, four, five, and 7.5, the ATR2 manages energy at a much lower level across the entire range, the broad range of protection that we're trying to get from the, the onset of the impact all the way through extreme high velocity impacts. All right, so the biggest change in ATR2 is that this ATR2 is completely rebuildable. It's modular. It's designed to be rebuilt. Um, whereas the ATR1, we kind of had to remanufacture the helmet, but the PSN it was just quite a task. Now our guys can do it in the office in about 15 to 20 minutes. It's four pins, two bolts. That offers the customer um, a lot more value out of the helmet. They can get a few rebuilds out of the life of it as long as the shell's in good condition. A few other changes with the helmet. Uh, the shell's been optimized. We took a lot of weight out of the helmet by reducing the amount of dampers. We were able to actually uh, reduce the weight as well as change the center of gravity of the helmet. So with that, the, the weight moves lower. So when it's on the rider's head, it feels much lower. Other features, uh, like Robert mentioned, was the cervical protection zone, the sternum pad, the clavicle cutaway to help against collarbone breaks. And on top of that, the standard features are removable and washable liner. Emergency release cheek pads, the EPP line chin bar. Goggle bin is integrated, uh, and as well as the nose guard and the whole the mouthpiece down, it's a little bit enlarged, so helps protect against roots as well. For the 2019 collection, we've released Two graphics in six colors, so this is the, the biggest selection that we've ever released for the user. The aero graphic uh, with matte black, a matte blue, a neon yellow, so the strike graphic and a neon orange, a uh, neon pink, and then a red, white, and blue. So um, we really try to create the colors for every rider. Um, so for the fit, basically the size has been scaled up a little bit, um, so now we're fit into it a little bit larger kids' heads. So, the idea being that a lot of kids in the 100cc, 125cc, were kind of going to the adult extra small a little bit too early, um, where now we can kind of fit them more properly with this helmet for the small show. The availability of the helmet, it's available today. Um, it's available on our website today. Um, for the media and our dealers, they want to get access to the images, uh, partner with all that stuff today as well. Uh, it'll be available in Europe, I uh, believe, about a week. And uh, the HR1 is going to continue to stay in our lineup as well. I touched on um, I, I touched on the head health challenge a little bit earlier, and uh, I just wanted to throw a uh, slide back in there to touch on it again today. But this was a really, really important study and opportunity for our company. We spent about a year and a half, probably almost two years, you know, working on stuff uh, having to do with this project. It ended up running a little longer than originally planned, and it had us working with multi-impact materials, which have made their way into the helmets, and uh, really have some key dynamics that work well in what we're trying to do to protect the athlete in the crash. So and this was a really important thing for us, and we're hoping to do some more in that uh, field down the road a little ways, but it was really, really valuable for us as we worked on ATR2 and subsequently ATR. To you. We did just touch on the size a little bit. Early on, we had a really hard time fitting large kids in our youth helmet. And then we introduced about, I don't know, two and a half years ago, we added an extra large size weight in that. And with that in mind, we tried to uh, bridge the gap between the ATR1 and the adult helmet uh, sizes, ATR1 youth, with the updated size weights in the ATR2 youth. So there's two different inside. Uh, EPS assemblies, one handle small and medium, and then there's a larger size for large and extra large uh, size weights for kids. So our hope is young adults, you know, 11, 12 years old, uh, will be remaining in the 60 youth helmet longer. Um, it's designed to work better and more efficiently with the lighter head forms of our young uh, athletes, our young, young adults that are out there riding. So, and then that's, uh, that kind of wraps up our presentation outside of any questions you guys might have. Our little statement here is um, our company is all about helmets. We're not uh, fooling around with anything else.